12, 12, 13, 12, 15, 12, 16, 12, 17, 12, 18, 12, 19, 12, 20, 12, 24, 12, 26. Are there any of those that need to be pulled off? Councilmember Toombs. Did you say 1209? I, I did say 1209. Would you like that taken off? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Any others? Okay, give me just a second. Okay, remind me if I, if I skip it. So I will, um, I will read the captions on those that are on consent. Is there anything else? You oh, that. No, I, thank you. I'll, that, but I'll, I'll remember that in the future. Okay, so the items on consent are, if I'm doing this correctly, And you asked to have 1209 taken off consent, is that correct? All right, I have done the wrong one. All right, this is on consent. All right, on consent, RS 2021-1208 sponsors Henderson, Allen, Withers, Bradford, Hauser, and Welch, authorizes the Director of Public Property Administration to exercise an option to purchase a parcel of property. Uh, RS 2021-1210 sponsors O'Connell, Allen, and Withers approves an amendment to the lease agreement between the Metro government and 404 Robertson Property LLC for office space in the Parkway Towers building. RS 2021-1211 sponsors Allen, Welsh, and Hauser appropriates grant funds from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to the Metro Action Commission for a Community Services Block Grant CARES Act Rapid Recycle Impact Project which offers opportunities to Head Start parents to obtain a Computing Technology Industry Associates credential. RS 2021-1212 sponsors Allen Withers, Bradford, and Welsh, approves a grant from the U.S. Department of the Interior National Service, Park Service to the Metro Nashville Historical Commission to provide funding for the completion of a historical context focused on Nashville resources associated with the Civil Rights Movement from 1944 to 1966 on consent. RS 2021-1213 sponsors Allen, Evans, Hauser, and Welsh, approves a coronavirus emergency supplemental funding grant from the Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration to the Metro Nashville Fire Department to ensure capability and capacity for providing more efficient and effective transportation and supply services for Nashville and Davidson County's homeless population. On consent to RS 2021-1215 sponsors Allen, Evans, Hauser, and Welsh, approves a coronavirus emergency supplemental funding grant from the Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration to the Metro Office of Emergency Management to provide logistical and practical means for the increasing capacity and more effective delivery of services while addressing the specific needs of the homeless population and their environment. RS 2021-1216 sponsors Allen and Bradford, approves an in-kind grant from the Metro Parks Foundation in conjunction with Sale Nashville to the Metro Board of Parks and Recreation in support of painting work on the Hamilton Creek Marina uh, Clubhouse. I have, let me check. On consent, I have a letter from the sponsor, is RS 2021-1217, sponsors Murphy, Allen, Bradford, and Welsh, approves an in-kind grant from the McCabe Park Little League to the Metro Nashville Parks and Recreation Department for roof replacement on the concession restroom building, four dugouts, and to build a scores table behind home plate. RS 2021-1218 sponsors Henderson, Allen, Bradford, Hauser, and Welsh, approves a grant from the Friends of Warner Park to the Metro Board of Parks and Recreation to provide seasonal staffing for the special work education and trails program at Warner Parks. On consent is RS 2021-1219 sponsors Henderson, Allen, Bradford, Hauser, and Welsh, Approves a grants package from the Friends of Warner Park to the Metro Board of Parks and Recreation to continue funding staff positions and copier costs. And further on consent are RS 2021-1220. Sponsor Sledge, Allen Withers, Young, and Welsh approves an intergovernmental agreement between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the Metro Department of Transportation Multimodal Infrastructure for a Highway Railroad Crossing Separation on Sadler Avenue at CSX Railroad. And the sponsor is here. Uh, on, also on consent is RS 2021-1221. Sponsors Taylor Murphy, Allen and Young. Approves a multimodal access grant from the Tennessee Department of Transportation to the Metro Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure 
to complete improvements along Charlotte Avenue from 28th Avenue North to 39th Avenue North to address existing pedestrian and bicycle facility gaps and other safety concerns. And one more, uh, RS 2021-1224 sponsors Hager, Allen, Withers and Young, authorizes the Metro Government of Water and Sewerage Services to enter into a pipeline crossing license agreement with R.J. Corman Railroad Company, Nashville and Eastern Railroad Line to construct and maintain a water main in the railroad right of way at Andrew Jackson Parkway and Old Lebanon Dirt Road. And last is RS 2021-1226, sponsors Welsh, Allen, Withers, and Young, amends resolution RS 2018-1445 to replace two parcels related to the acquisition and removal of flood-prone properties in the Mill Creek, Thorgan Branch, and Whitmore Creek watersheds. That is the consent agenda. It's been moved. Second, do I have a second? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, all those in favor? Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. With that, we'll go back to the other items. I actually have not done a roll call, so let me do that real quickly. Alan Druffel, Glover, Here. Hurt, Mendez, Pulley, Roten, not yet, Sledge, Nawara, Syracuse, Toombs, Van Reese, Bircher. Okay, that gives us one, two, three, four. Well, so we'll begin with RS 2021-1191, sponsors Gamble, Taylor, Toombs, Suara, Welsh, Allen, and Porterfield, which recognizes the North Nashville Bordeaux Participatory Budgeting Steering Committee and process. And with that, do, do I have a motion? Then moved and seconded. I would like to uh, recognize Councilmember Fabian Bedney and uh, members of the committee who have taken their time to come here. Mr. Bedney? Okay, that microphone is not working. If you'll go to Mr. Rutherford's desk, you, can you hand him your mic? Long arm, yes. Special circumstances. He's sitting on my desk. That's right. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, thank you very much for your work. I'm sure everybody tells you that, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about participatory budgeting. I have here with me Judge Bell and Ms. Grants. They are both members of the 18 member steering committee uh, that are uh, representatives from the North Nashville Bordeaux community, recommended by some of you. Uh, and uh, they are here to uh, 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 be in support of the work they did. They set up the guidelines that are being followed for the participatory budgeting on Bordeaux and North Nashville. This is a community driven effort. All of you should have a copy, and uh, I appreciate uh, you uh, considering and the sponsors considering recognizing their hard work. It is awesome when we see uh, local residents taking a leadership role in trying to improve their own community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you all so much for being on the committee and for making the time to come down here. Uh, we are ready to vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? All right, we recommend approve. Thank you so much. Next is RS 2021-1199, sponsors Allen, Evans, and Welsh. This approves a coronavirus emergency supplemental funding grant from the Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration to the Davidson County Juvenile Court to mitigate and spread respiratory, to mitigate the spread of respiratory droplets and or reduce transmission of COVID-19 by utilizing masks and plexiglass barriers in courtrooms. Can I get a motion? Been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Recommend. Next is RS 2021-1201, sponsors Allen. This determines the issuance of general obligation bonds of the Metropolitan Government in an amount not to exceed $568,855,000. This is also known as the Capital Spending Plan Resolution. Um, we are going to defer this by rule, but there are a number of amendments that um, I think it would be useful to at least have introduced, uh, and we could have uh, some, some discussion if needed, but we don't necessarily need to debate and decide on these because we, they've just come out. So to give us time to do that, we will be deferring this um, by rule. So with that, is there a, um, 
Do we, can we make the motion to defer and then go ahead and talk about the amendments or should we just, okay. Okay, there's a motion to defer. Um, and then there are amendments that I would uh, just like to have explained to people. And if, if they, we have questions while the sponsor's here, you can ask questions um, and then we'll defer all of them together and give everyone time to study it before we vote on this important stuff. So uh, Council Member Bradford had to be in another part of town uh, and it is not here. Um, his amendment, I do not have the amendments in front of me here. I have them here. Okay, Council Member Bradford had Amendment 1, which amends the caption recital clause. They all do that. Uh, and, and increases the amount by $4.5 million, which he would like to add to um, New Murfreesboro Road, Bradley Parkway Branch Library. So that is, that is Amendment 1. Any questions on that? Next is Amendment 2, uh, resolution. Uh, we got sponsors for that one, so I'll ask if any of the sponsors want to speak. I see Mr. Mendez. Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, so Amendment 2 would um, reduce $15 million from one of the um, bigger line items in the capital spending plan. Um, there's a $45 million line item that's entitled um, Restoration and Resiliency Partnership Funding uh, for $45 million. And then it lists four separate um, CIB project numbers with it. And uh, one of the CIB project numbers is for the Jefferson Street cap, which is in the CIB for $189 million, $15 million for this fiscal year. And my, well, I mean, I'll just be blunt about it. Um, you know, it's a 45-page piece of legislation. There's a four or five-page press release that went along with it that named playgrounds and roof repairs and all sorts of relatively mundane things. And it didn't, none of that stuff, the legislation nor the long press release mentioned the Jefferson Street cap anywhere. And I would submit that um, that's not ready for prime time for spending. I don't think um, there's been more than one community meeting. I think there was mixed reaction to it. And I don't think that it's appropriate for Spending, aside from that just personal opinion, I'm very sure um, that the way this particular item was in the um, capital spending plan is at odds with all the hard work the council has done over the last four or five years to reform the way capital spending plans work. The way it's supposed to work now is that there's a specific dollar amount for specific um, CIB project numbers. So we all know exactly what's being spent and that was a reaction to prior CSPs five, six years ago that just would have giant lump sums, that there was a lot of flexibility for the administration. Here, by having a $45 million line item with four different CIB project numbers, it's impossible to see what's going on without doing some deep digging. And, and frankly, I think that if I wasn't raising the question, um, we would still be this far into it and nobody would know that the Jefferson Street cap was in the capital spending plan. And so my main goal is a public conversation to make sure what wasn't in the press release, what's not listed on the summary sheets, is like there's money in here, a lot of money, ten, like over $10 million worth of money for the Jefferson Street cap. And if that is a thing that there's a public consensus, public discussion of, and, um, and it's a go, then sure, let's, let's start um, spending money on it. But um, if not, then it might not be ready for prime time on spending. And I do want to make sure that my co-sponsor for the amendment, Council Member Hurt, has a chance to talk about it because I think her perspective, while similar, um, is, uh, uh, is different. And so I, I, would, I think we should hear from her too. Thank you. Council Member Hurt. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Council Member Mendez. Uh, yes, I think that the process for this uh, proposal has been less than um, transparent. I think that 
Um, the conversations with the community have has not been held. There has been one meeting. And had the uh, application gone through um, when it was submitted back in July, I'm not sure we would be having this conversation now. So I'm concerned that this is a project that has already been signed, sealed, and delivered, although it's being presented that it is something that the community wants. And I have attended uh, hundreds of meetings, and it has not been one time I've heard that, that the Jefferson Street cap is something that the community wants. And I further know that they are asking for affordable housing, although I know these funds are not used for that. But I do know that not only could those funds be used for reconnecting communities, it could be used for road safety, for high-speed internet, uh, possibly environmental clean air, and other things that will definitely impact the community. Uh, and I'm not sure um, that, that this is something that um, the administration has, well, I'm sure that they've not spoken with the community itself to determine if this is something that they want. It is clearly, um, consistent with gentrification in that community. And it all is connected to all of the development that we have uh, ongoing. And I think that as a city, we missed the opportunity to uplift each and every part of the city to make the entire city better. And if we were to do that, and I'm also concerned about those that are coming in that community, if um, <clears throat> they will be utilized in Nashville General Hospital. And if they will not be utilized in Nashville General Hospital, what's actually going to happen to that? And especially knowing that we have a Meharry Medical College whose students train at that hospital. So I think there needs to be a lot more discussion in regards to this. And I don't want it to be pushed through uh, as quickly as it has been. And I think it's been a lot of window dressing to it because everyone that I've spoken with says that they would rather see affordable housing. They would rather see support for black businesses that are there and have some cultural compassion for that uh, historic community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask if the administration could, there were, there were three items that weren't um, spelled out and I think your mic is not working. So if you can, um, if Mr. Mendez would share his mic, um, if someone from the administration could just uh, address the three items that had numbers but no name or dollar sign next to them in the capital spending plan and if that's something that could be added when we see it next and do you want a I can discussion on the jefferson street cap in particular if you would like to say something about that that is uh your choice but um here's here's the I'll show you on my notebook those three items had numbers but no um so is that is that information that could be added when this comes back absolutely and just for the record just so my colleagues here this is the state of good repair Restoration and Resiliency. Yeah, partner. Race, restoration Resiliency Partnership Funding 22 PW 4 Underneath it, it had three more numbers and no no breakdown. Right. I think that's in, included in the, the itemization number. Possibly. It's a little hard to tell. Okay. I'll, I'll so confirm that. So if that could that, be, if that could be clarified sure. when, it, when it comes and back. Just so everybody else knows. So that the sub items below that are part of the larger number at the, at the top, but we will clarify that as well. Okay. Um, with respect to the Jefferson Street Cap, I can't, uh, Ms. Massimo is here um, with us and has been uh, bird dogging this is, is too kind, but just want to assure council members this is not uh, setting forth the spending uh, that would go forward without your additional approval um, uh, in the months to come. And let me, uh, let me hand it over to Mr. Massimo. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to address this. So. We know that at the present time, the schedule for a next CSP is not known. Um, and what we do know is that we've committed the next four to five months. Um, we have scheduled meetings on the Jefferson Street cap and we're in the midst of a community led design process to enable the community to decide, do they want a cap? And if they want a cap, what do they want it to look like? So knowing that and knowing the schedule that is currently contemplated for upcoming uh, federal grant opportunities, which will be after the first of the year, um, around the time that we would be concluding that process. We know that in order to be competitive, 
you've got to come as a local government to the table with your funding commitment. So we're asking for this to be included now in this CSP with the idea that it would then be ready to go to demonstrate our worthiness for grant funds that will likely be available right after the first of the year. We can reconfirm those schedules with USDOT if you would like for us to for sure. Um, and then if for some reason the community does not support the cap, then these funds could be deauthorized and and would not would not go forward for this purpose. So thank you. Um, okay. One more, one more opportunity. We're not necessarily debating. We're just, we're just gathering information. So we'll have two weeks well, to think about. I this. mean, it wasn't in the press release. It wasn't in the legislation. This is the only time we got to ask about it. Um, so, the very first sentence was, um, "This doesn't constitute final approval. It'll come back before the council before we could do anything." And at the end of it, it was, "Government needs to see that we're fully committed." And there, therein lies the rub. Like, this is authorization to spend the money, full stop, period. And so I don't know how you show commitment to the federal government that it's ready to go with, with a hard commitment from the city and also still make it subject to later council approval. That's just not the way it works. And again, you know, we're not moving the amendment, say it's just initial discussion, but... That's the first I heard that, and I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Hurt. Thank you. Uh, my question is, did the community uh, suggest or ask for a cap to be brought to Jefferson Street, or was that uh, led by the administration? Cap, you, is, as I think many of you know, has a really long history. Um, in terms of the original conversations around the cap that were held back in the mid-60s when the interstate came through. In more recent years, the Civic Design Center led uh, various design challenges that looked at caps in that area that the community participated in. Um, and then, of course, it was also included in the Metro Nashville Transportation Plan when we went through the 12-month process that led up to the adoption or approval of that plan uh, last year. So there have been a lot of conversations that the community has been involved in, and there hasn't been an indication of not wanting a cap. Now, when we've been in the recent community meetings where we're talking about the specifics of the cap, as you can well imagine, there are lots of different opinions and ideas. And, um, and it also brings back a lot of the feelings about I-40 having come through. That's all very, um, I think, typical. And we understand that, and that's why we're being very thoughtful about moving through this community-led design process. Thank you. Appreciate that discussion. Councilmember Glover. I, I just want to add one thing to what Councilman Mendez said, and that, that's very real. If, if it goes in here, then it, it's real, and the money can be spent. And so, therefore, uh, I think that um, uh, if Council Lady Hurt, uh, you know, it has obviously been involved with this community very deeply, and I, I look frequently to what she has to say on this, uh, but do know, because for those of us who have been around for a while, um, the, if that money goes in there, then it's spent. Then come back out. You can talk about deauthorizing it, but that's a long process. So uh, I would just recommend we be cautious. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sledge. Thank you. Um, in addition to what my colleagues have said, I'm a little... I have questions about the timing of the funding because I think as we've all been paying attention to congressional action or lack thereof, you know, there's a line item in the bipartisan infrastructure bill that's a billion dollars for reconnecting communities. And this exact kind of project is what always gets cited. Unfortunately, this project doesn't get cited. It's typically projects in other parts of the country um, whose price tag well exceeds the billion dollars that's being um, proposed. So I guess my question is, you know, I hear this about commitment that we need to show the federal government we're committed to do this. Are we apply? I just don't see this project put into those conversations at all. So it concerns me that we're actually not far enough down the road to say federal government, we want to do this because there's this line item that's just blinking out there for federal funds. And I just don't see us discussed. So I mean, I, I just have a lot of questions when it comes to that because it seems like this is ripe for this, and yet we keep talking about committing 
local funds to something that seems like it could be federally funded if we were working that angle. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on this uh, uh, amendment? Council Member Bircher, I think your your mic will work if, if uh, Ms. Eitlin will turn it on. Oh, she has the power. She has the power. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and you're doing a, a fantastic job. You're kind. For me, uh, I have a question too, just just as a body, and I've I've brought this up before on some legislation in the past. If someone could help me reconcile in the capital spending plan, we're making reference to authorize uh, monies for a department that doesn't exist or is even mentioned in the CIB. So. I don't know if that's a legal question. How do we legally, how do we, how do we authorize money to a department where we haven't as a body approved those said projects in the capital improvement budget? I think, can someone legal answer that question? Mr. Mendez, can we use your mic again? Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Lady Vircher. We've, um, had some precedent with uh, similar department formations in years past. We didn't used to have um, uh, an IT department separate and distinct. And typically what has happened is that an MOU establishes the responsibilities of that entity. And for that purposes, it becomes a legal entity that can receive fund, transpose the funds. That's what's happening here. It, is, it does remain a priority on the upcoming charter amendments process. That's not gonna resolve the capital spending plan. But in terms of it being legally allowed to allocate, receive monies, NDOT is established through the MOU. Okay, so legally it allows the department to do business as a department that's defined in the charter, even though that department doesn't doesn't exist yet. It becomes and an entity. We, and that we voted on. Under okay. the, yeah, under the metro uh, government, uh, it becomes an entity, a functioning entity there that can both receive monies, allocate monies, function as a department, hire staff, have a director, et cetera. Interesting. And, and because we're doing it in this manner, being that the department isn't yet approved, do we foresee like any, any lawsuits as it relates to procurement or anything like that with the, with the department? Are they bound by the same uh, regulations as the department in the charter? They are bound by all the regulations that apply throughout the code, for example, through procurement and, and budget and finance requirements. There's not been a, a hint of legislation aimed at that, nor have there been any history of legislation aimed at other departments that similarly had to take shape before there was a charter amendment, the IT department, for example. But this is different. This, this department is way, way much larger as it relates to money than the IT department. And the contracts are a little different, too, from this department than the IT department as well. Like, IT don't do the level of contracts that, that our public works department does. Understood. There was a, some degree of, of urgency with respect to getting uh, qualified federal and state funding uh, that led to, among the other reasons, for, for the formation of the uh, NDOT. Um, that came before this council and was approved. The MOU was voted on and approved. It does have the standing to accept the monies that would be allocated to the CSP for their uh, spending as itemized. So I think legally, understand it's a difference in size in terms of it compared to IT. But as a legal entity, it is sufficient. So in the past with the IT department, we, we authorized spending for that department before it existed? No, it used to be a, a separate, uh, just a division within the finance department um, and did not have separate funding. It was all funded through the finance department. Uh, it was formed in, uh, by the council approved process to first establish it as a separate entity before it was formalized and then received funding, allocated funding, hired a staff, hired a director. Okay, thank you. You, you answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Other, other questions on this amendment? All right, that brings us to the final amendment by Councilmember Sledge, if you'd like to explain amendment number four. No. No, it doesn't. Excuse me, what am I missing? Three. Whoops. Sorry, can't count. Okay, back to amendment number three. Uh, Councilmembers O'Connell, Roberts, Sepulveda, Welsh, and Cash. I'm just going to wait for a hand to go up, and I'll recognize Councilmember O'Connell. Well, I'm not on the committee, but I'm happy to discuss the you're, amendment. You're if... welcome to discuss. Okay, okay great. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the recognition. Um, this one's tough. Uh, I love the zoo. Our family has been 
members for the better part of a decade, uh, and we have enjoyed many programs there from Zufari Slumber to uh, Boo at the Zoo, except we missed this year, um, but we've been there in costume many times. Um, and yet also, I have to say, as a first and foremost, as a graduate of My City Academy with the class of 2014, and then as somebody who was early to the Vision Zero process, I'm troubled by what the comment that we're making with this uh, combined billion dollars in capital allocation uh, this calendar year. So this amendment uh, seeks to change $15 million uh, in taxpayer funds being awarded to the zoo for a parking deck uh, and instead replaces that with neighborhood traffic calming programs and Vision Zero sidewalks, which uh, don't have much funding in this capital spending plan, bikeways, which have even less funding in this capital spending plan, and transit, which is a tough one for me. This one, as you all remember, we had a good, healthy, sometimes tense discussion about transit funding in the spring. Um, and I think if we ever do a letter of intent about what's going to appear in a capital spending program, I'd like the level of detail that is in this uh, uh, capital spending plan in that letter, because we talked extensively about uh, how WeGo Transit could not currently expand their fleet to match operating improvements because we didn't have the capital. Um, and we heard that from WeGo themselves. Uh, we just expanded our bus service, but the capital allocated in this capital spending plan, the second of two, again, in that billion dollar allocation of capital, uh, only two million goes to expansion of buses for better bus service improvements. The rest goes to grant matches, which are good and necessary. Uh, it goes to planning, which again is good and necessary, and it goes, 12 million of it goes to replacement but only 2 million of that 26.7 million uh, actually goes to improved and expanded bus service. So having walked the Nolansville corridor, personally myself as part of a Vision Zero process with multiple departments, other council members as part of a big expression, uh, I, I would invite and encourage anybody in the room right now or anybody on council or really anybody to understand the severity of this to try to walk from the zoo to Plaza Mariachi, just a little bit southeast down Nolansville Road, or to walk from there to Harding Place, which was the site of another important uh, sidewalk expansion spanning two interstates where you could watch the, the pathway in the dirt, right? The, the segment commonly called cow paths because of the high rate of pedestrian activity. I cite my experience in My City Academy because in that experience, what I heard from someone in our new Nashvilleian community uh, was the express expression of sort of shock and surprise uh, that in Nashville, your car becomes your feet because you cannot walk anywhere. Uh, and that was in, that was from some, someone in that southeastern stretch of Nolansville. Uh, you know, to me, in inviting thousands of more cars to this site, while not making any of the other improvements that this corridor desperately needs, and barely making any of the citywide improvements, a billion dollars is a transformative amount of money. And we are not transforming the way people move around this city or can move around this city. So I encourage colleagues to join me in supporting this amendment. Thank you. Other questions or comments on this one? Yes, Council Member Johnston. Thank you for recognizing me, even though I'm not on the committee. Um, this, the zoo is in District 26, which is why I'm here. And there are a lot of points to what Councilman O'Connell just said that I wholeheartedly agree with. I think we are woefully underfunded on w exactly what he's talking about. Should that come to the detriment of a project for the zoo that has been in District 26 CIB for years because it is desperately needed to support the capacity that they already have, much less the growing capacity they're going to have when they expand with the African safari uh, uh, exhibits? Um, it's unfortunate that the zoo has been thrown into this argument because it shouldn't be pitted against something that is very important, which is traffic calming. I'm the biggest proponent, proponent of traffic calming. There's no, I mean, my district is nothing but a cut through district. We've got, it's awful. So I understand the importance of, of sidewalks. I understand the importance of, of, of fleet. All of those things are very important, not to the detriment of another project that has literally been through three administrations. This project initially had a price tag of $20 million. We are now up to $35 million 
because we've had multiple administrations sit on their hands about it. We've got private dollars that are now at almost 60% paying for this project. $15 million represents 42.8% of what this is actually going to cost. The zoo is unbelievably important to District 26. It's unbelievably important to this county. It's the, I think it fights for number one, number two, as the, the biggest attraction with the most visitors. It services the entire Middle Tennessee area. We've got visitors from all over the country that come to this fantastic zoo. So what I would encourage folks is to, I don't know why the zoo was picked out. <laughs> and I don't think it's about the zoo either. I think everybody loves the zoo. Um, I think if there's other places to pull it from, or if we just say, we're just going to increase the, the CSP by $15 million to accommodate what Councilman uh, O'Connell is saying, which I agree is important. My question would be, if, this, if these allocations to these four, um, four uh, items that he has uh, delineated, if those allocations were made, could we actually fulfill what what he's asking. So if we put another $3 million to sidewalks, are we gonna be able to build an extra $3 million of sidewalks in any amount of time period? I truly don't know how long it takes. I don't know what's in the pipeline. I don't know what that entails, but I don't want to allocate dollars that aren't going to be used when I know that the $15 million will be used to build this much needed garage and also be unlocking private dollars through not only a donation, but through debt. So I would encourage my colleagues to really take a look at this. Um, if this amendment stands, I, I, I would encourage um, just an, an increase. And I don't like increasing debt. I'm the last person that wants to increase our debt. But I do think that this is an important allocation. And if we can figure something else out, great. But let's not pit priorities that are priorities against a much needed project. Thank you. Thank you. And in a minute, I'm going to come to finance to talk a little bit about what would happen if we increase the debt. So be thinking about that one. Uh, Council Member Sledge and then Council Member Sepulveda. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I appreciate, I appreciate both my colleagues and, and the points that they're making. I think it's extremely difficult to see a project in your district um, to feel like it's targeted and feel like you're having to stand up and fight for it in a way that you wouldn't feel like you'd want to be put in that position. I think one of the I think one of the points that Councilmember O'Connell is trying to make in, in this discussion is there are a lot of I think personally us and and probably members of our district and Councilmember Johnson and I share this corridor, the Knowlesville Pike corridor, that we'd like to get back and forth between our districts um, in a way that wasn't adding to the traffic on Knowlesville Pike, which is already uh, pretty substantial. And, and we we don't have it. We have BRT light, but we don't have the kind of service that we need for a family who'd want to go to the zoo on the weekend to be able to take really any other form of transportation than a car. And so I think that's the that's the discussion that we're being asked to have is, um, are we really creating a way, um, multiple ways, I guess, to access this incredible gym in our community, um, or are we being told effectively through our spending, through our decisions, that there is one way to access this incredible gym in our, in our community, and it requires the greatest outlay of personal capital possible, which is to own or have access to a car. So I think that's the conversation that we're trying to have, um, and I appreciate the fact that we're having that conversation, and quite frankly, we should have that conversation with every community asset we have and how we get to it. Um, one thing I do wanna point out that I've been dismayed about, and I, I said this to zoo officials when they reached out, was I feel like we all kind of got hit by this um, <laughs> as members that even though it's been in previous CIBs, as Councilmember Johnson noted, no, no idea that this was this particular kind of project within the zoo was the priority here. And the response, and I said, I told the zoo, I said, I'm kind of disappointed that there hasn't been a, a level of outreach that I would have expected in, in years past and CIBs and CSPs past. And the answer I got back was that they were notified the day before the CSP was publicized that this was in the CSP. And that furthermore, they were told that they were not to contact other council members. So when that occurs, similar to what Council Member Mendez says with his amendment, where it looks like there's something being put in and 
deliberately to not have conversation about it, then I think it is our job as council members, no matter what the project is, to have that conversation. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Sepulveda. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me, even though uh, I'm not on this committee. I have signed on as a co-sponsor to Council Member O'Connell's legislation. I've lived off of the Nolansville corridor since I was five uh, in my district. And I, I know firsthand how hard it is to get around the, no the Nolansville Pike. It, it, it's just difficult. It's pretty much non-existent. Uh, you try to get from one side of the street to another in a major intersection and you could be hit by a car. I, I have part of Harding. Uh, I, I'm across from Council Member Johnston's uh, district, so just right down the street from, from the zoo. I went to the zoo when I was a child. I, I think that we need to figure out what our priorities are. I, I believe that we need more sidewalks. I get calls every day wanting more sidewalks. I have calls from people wanting our, our bus routes expanded and more bus shelters and more traffic calming. I would rather put money into seeing that and try and figure out another solution for the zoo. I think the zoo is important and it does bring uh, a lot of visitors to, to our part of town, but I wanna make sure that the people who live and work in our neighborhoods are able to get around easily Almost, I think 25% of my district live at or below the poverty line. Sometimes we don't have access to reliable transportation and we want to make sure that our bus routes are reliable and we want to make sure that we expand them and we figure out a, a good transportation plan. And so I, I, I applaud Council Member O'Connell for bringing this forward and I would ask my colleagues for support. Thank you. Other other comments on this? Uh, let's see. Council Member Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Council Member Bircher had her hand up. <laughs> Next. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the recognition. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for this wonderful conversation. When I first saw the amendment, uh, my first reaction was, this is a good idea. Uh, not the amendment. Uh, when I first saw that the zoo was getting the parking lot, I thought it was a great idea because of the parking that uh, uh, traffic that backs onto Nolensville Road. And as somebody who doesn't live in that corridor but travels up and down it, the traffic there is a lot. So I'm thinking that the parking lot would actually help that, uh, and I was in support of it. But sitting here and listening to all the conversation that is being had, uh, uh, if I have to make a choice between the two, which I think are great uh, ideas, but if I have to make a choice, then I would rather we, we deal with something that helps the people that lives in the neighborhood. Because one of the things everyone talks about is our visitors, whether it's out of towners, or maybe even locals like myself that live in other part of the city going to the zoo that don't want traffic. What about the people that live in the area that are not able to enjoy the, uh, uh, the amenities or even go to the zoo itself? So I think if we can do both, that would be ideal. But if it comes to a choice, I think we have to come back to making sure that our citizens that live in our local areas are taken care of first. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Vircher, I apologize. Thank you for waiting. Uh, excuse me. Point of order. Good point. No, I mean, we, we, are, we are just trying to get information. I, I appreciate you raising that. So if you'll remember, this is information, Council Member Vircher and then Council Member Munez. Thank you for that reminder, Mr. Thank Foley. you, Chair, and you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know that. You're nice to say that. Um, this, is, this is my informational question. So the zoo charges for parking? I don't. Can someone answer that? I have not paid for parking the last couple of times. Ah, we have a representative from the zoo here. Can you, can you answer that question? And then you'll need to use Council Member Rutherford's microphone. And if you'll... Uh, you know, introduce yourself as. Sure. I'm Rick Schwartz. I'm CEO of the Nashville Zoo. The zoo charges parking um, for non-members. So we have about a base of 40,000 members. Their, their parking is free. We charge for non-members. Thank you for that clarification. Council Member Vircher. That was my question. All right. Thank you. Um, and Council Member Mendez and then Mr. Schwartz, we may give you a second if you want to respond further. First, Mr. Mendez. Thanks. This is uh, really a process question. Um, I think the rules are that uh, 
for every item over $5 million in the capital spending plan, there's supposed to be an itemization form in Exhibit B. And maybe I just missed it, but um, this, I think, is the only project over $5 million that doesn't have an itemization form. And even if the form is just going to say, we're going to give all the money to the zoo, there still should be an itemization form in the legislation for this item. Thank you. Thank you. Is that duly noted back there? I see, I see it being typed down. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Schwartz, if you have any other information you could provide about what this would do and, and why this is um, Thank you so much. Um, we, we moved to the Grassmere property in 1997. In our first year attendance, we did 73,000 visitors. We had 268 parking spaces. We have expanded five times uh, and, and a lot of help through Metro to do that. We now have 1,848 spaces, but our attendance has increased close to 1,700% uh, since we took over. In, in 2019, we did 1.2 million 66,000 visitors. We had the highest growth rate of any zoo in the country between 2017 and 2019. We had a 32% growth in attendance, uh, and the average is about 5% nationally. So uh, on our busy days, our peak days, we can easily accommodate six or 7,000 visitors, which is a normal day for us on the weekends. But as uh, spring break approaches and the popularity of the zoo has become more apparent and award-winning exhibits, uh, we're having days of 10,000 and 15,000 visitors with 1,848 spaces. So the problem occurs then that the, uh, out when our parking lots are exhausted, people park on the grass, people can get quite creative uh, if left unattended. So we have to pull about 10 people out of the staff, which ordinarily take care of the restrooms and clean the trash to make sure people park safely. People park across the street, um, not legally actually, they park across the street in a lot of the merchants uh, parking spaces and end up crossing the street and walking up the pathway. And on numerous occasions, we've the congestion is so strong because people can't park. Uh, one day uh, to the north, traffic was backed up past 440, and to the south, uh, all the way to Old Hickory Boulevard, the police actually closed the zoo on several occasions to keep traffic moving. The merchants get upset, uh, the motorists get upset, uh, and I think the biggest challenge for us is, you know, when you're a parent and you tell your children you're going to come to the zoo. On those peak days, literally hundreds of cars have to turn around and leave the zoo because there is no physical space to park them. On certain occasions, we'll park six or 700 cars in the very back of the property where the new African exhibit's gonna take place. So we're, we truly are one of the, the fastest growing zoos in the country, and we will be, and we kind of are now at a complete standstill. We won't be able to do any more expansion until we have parking. It's just not an option for us We've used all of the contiguous space that we have. And so the only option is, is to go to to an additional level. And we hope in the future that um, all these additional means of transportation will be great. We had an independent consultant look where, again, 1.2 million visitors in 2019, and with the growth of our plans and the African expansion, they're projected to, to reach 2.1 or 2.2 million visitors. So we'll obviously have to have alternative means to get there, but Right now, it's a very dangerous situation when you have parents and children and strollers going in and out of uh, incoming traffic, and the line is all the way down to Nolan's Road, and you can't turn. So, Thank you. Appreciate that, that context. Council Member Virtue. Thank you again, Chair. Um, I'm piggybacking off of Councilman Mendez. This is a, a, a process question. Um, how was the project decided for this capital spending plan? that these projects was a, a priority for the city and the body? The council has worked through various prioritization processes for council recommended projects. And that goes both to departments and the administration is aware of it. When it comes to the CSP, I'm gonna ask someone from the administration table to talk about how the prioritization then happens. So there are several factors that go into the prioritization, and the council's prioritization list is, is an enormously significant factor. What we also have to consider is department expertise, but also leveraging. If we have this two, pick two random projects, and one of them, if we fund it to $5 million, will get us an additional $5 million from state or federal or even private sources 
that moves up compared to the other project, assuming they're equal otherwise, it's never going to get equivalent leveraging of monies. With respect to the zoo, um, Mr. Schwartz was uh, referencing and Councilmember Johnson was referencing, the $15 million opens up additional uh, funding uh, from other sources. And so that elevated its, um, its prioritization above and beyond what Councilmember Johnson had proposed it for originally. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney uh, Jamison. Chair, just one more just process question, uh, because this, was, this reminds me of um, it's somewhat akin to the water park when, when, we, when we subsidize that. And they were great. They made uh, concessions for, uh, for um, uh, entrance for that park for all of Davidson County, although uh, they, may not have, they may not have wanted to stay at the hotel, but they could utilize uh, the water park if they showed that they were, were a resident. In the case of the zoo, He's, if we were to subsidize, you're talking about? I forget the the water park. Remember the water, water park? park? Okay, good. yeah. I thought you said yeah. Warner Park. Sorry, yeah, water I'm, park. It's this mask. As it relates to the to the zoo, because we all want to be supporters of the zoo, but at the same time, we have to justify and balance whether or not is this fifteen million dollars the best use uh, of taxpayer dollars, and as it currently stands. Uh, if you're a member of the zoo, you, you have free parking. But if I'm a Davidson County resident and I choose not to become a member for whatever reason, I may not go to the zoo as often, then I, I'm taxed again with paying parking to utilize the zoo for a space that essentially I'm already paying for, but I don't have that free access to. Would the zoo be open to some type of concession for those taxpayers? Not talking about the, the ones that's already uh, already paying, but would, would they be would they make a concession for, for that? I think it would help the body in, in its decision. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll pass that question forward. All right. Um, we are supposed to be, this is supposed to be information. Council Member Syracuse, since you haven't spoken yet. Ms. Zeitlin. Sorry. There we go. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, during the operating budget, Councilmember O'Connell advocated that we go to get an additional allocation that when we dove deeper into it, we go said, well, I don't really need the operating, I need the capital. And as you recall, we did get a letter from Mayor's Chief of Staff promising that money to be in this capital spending plan. So just confirming with somebody in the administration was that actually done in this proposed capital spending plan? Um, I see it's the heads nodding, yes. So, um, th so what I just want to make sure of is that if we're going to be taking away this $15 million and we've got these four extra uh, buckets that we're adding in, I don't want it to be arbitrary. Do we have a specific knowledge in, of what those four uh, extra allocations for those buckets are going to go towards. I heard colleagues talk about, well, it could be added to transportation, bikeway, pedestrian connectivity along Nolensville Pike. Uh, do we know that these dollars are going to go to that? Um, those, so, so I ask that, not to get necessarily get uh, answers now, but I would ask that, can we get those answers by the time we have to vote on this? Thank okay, you. all right, that, I mean, this, this, Amendment does specifically put that into the CSP. Councilmember Johnston and then Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you for recognizing me again. I'm sorry, I have to leave for a speaking engagement, but I did want to point out as far as um, walkability on Nolensville Pike, it is not great. I, I, will, I will admit to that, but we do have a beautiful brand new WeGo bus stop right there at Zoo Road. It's amazing. Um, so that we are, we are doing some things. Do we have a long way to go? Yes. Um, is that necessarily the fault of the zoo? No. Do they want it to be walkable? Absolutely. But we've got visitors from all over God's creation. Um, and so, again, it's, we're, we're working. The other thing I wanted to point out is that Nolan's Road is a state route. So we, <laughs> there's, there's some dollars there that we could use some help um, as far as that whole corridor from, from the state. So, Thank you. Councilmember O'Connell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and again for the recognition. Thank you, Councilmember Syracuse, for the question. It's a good one. Um, two things I would note. Yes, the 
26 plus million is there for WeGo, but as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, only 2 million, less than 10% of that allocation is actually for expanded bus service, which was the entire point of the conversation. Um, as for how this would get allocated, it's like anything else we do in this regard, and this is entirely the reason why so many of us had invested uh, years into what were strategic plans so we wouldn't have to have that exact conversation about everything. The entire point and premise of walk and bike, the entire point and premise of in motion is so that when dollars become available opportunistically, you can apply them strategically. And so we should be able to do this work if we're willing to do it. I'd certainly love to see it on Nolansville, but I know there are communities across the city that would love to see uh, sidewalks delivered. Thank you. Good point. Um, and just, just to wrap it up, um, if finance could, I mean, give you your debut, Kelly. Um, if you could just very quickly address two questions. One, what if we just wanted to increase the capital spending plan? What does that do to the debt service? Uh, and then the second question, can you just speak very briefly to um, does funding, does putting this money in there mean it gets spent this year or is there such a thing as a backlog and do we have one? We have one. Okay. I'll start with the end first. Okay. So um, the CSP is when budget approves projects. It's not necessarily when shovels hit ground and money leaves the door. So while you approve 420 Five, I think it was earlier this year, probably none of that has left the building yet um, because projects aren't ready to go. So we do have a backlog currently. So this all in one billion that we're contemplating probably won't actually hit the bond market for another 24, 36 months. We'll pay interest solely on whatever we draw for commercial paper, but we won't pay principal until we actually do the bond offering. And I, I apologize that council member Johnson had to leave I didn't get her request, so I don't have the full metrics. But as a kind of rule of thumb in the current 3% 20-year borrowing for every million dollars you spend, that's about $67,000 a year. So a million dollars really costs about a million three. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's helpful. And Kelly Flannery, new finance director, forgot to introduce you. Thank you for answering those questions. Okay, we, we have spent a lot of time on this, but it is important that we all understand it, so I appreciate the discussion and information gathering. Anything else on that amendment or can we move on to amendment four? Council Member Sledge, any, anything you wanna say about that one? Yes, um, mercifully short for my colleagues. Thank you. Um, so I like uh, amendment, I don't wanna speak for Council Member Bradford, but like amendment one, our, our amendments address items that are for future fiscal years. Uh, this is to add $50 million to the CSP for the, to fund the first phase of construction for the National School of the Arts point being that we have actually allocated, this body has allocated nearly $12 million toward design and land purchase. Um, you'll remember last term that the land purchase that was proposed was 88 Hermitage, which is in this CSP, which we can discuss later time. Um, but I won't be bringing this amendment to the full body um, because of the fiscal year item, but I do wanna note for colleagues that we are going to be considering in a couple of weeks, the purchase of that same property for a different use while still having not considered nor approved property for its original attended, intended use, and National School of the Arts continues to meet in a facility that is woefully outdated and would never be used for the purpose that we would send um, our children to learn about the arts, drama, music, in, in a facility such as this if we had the chance to do it from scratch. So I would highly encourage MPS and the administration to find a suitable piece of land and bring it to this council to consider. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, point made. Great, thanks for that discussion on all those amendments. Please um, remember that we are deferring this so we can have plenty of time to understand this better and to get more information. Uh, if you have questions, please send them to Ms. Zeitlin and she will forward those to departments and we will have the council SharePoint with written answers for those as well as um, hoping they will come back again uh, when they have this on, I see a hand wave, when we have this come back to us in, in two weeks, and I do appreciate everyone being here. Uh, Council Member Mendez. Um, thanks for that reminder about uh, other comments. Um, and just, uh, I just want to understand the process. I, we got the email that says other, any comments are due by this Friday, November 5 at noon. And so I've only brought up the couple of biggest picture items, but I've got another um, set of questions I'm working on. 
And the email we got said we're going to get responses by November 12. And my concern is that we're going to get responses after the amendment deadline for our next meeting. And so I'm just, I'm trying to figure out, like, if, if we don't get responses from the administration until after the amendment deadline, then either we have to assume the worst and offer a bunch of amendments or we're on a track to defer it again next time. I'm just wondering whether we can accelerate the getting of the responses from the administration so we can get it before the amendment deadline. Good and question. it looks like Thank Mr. You. Glover has a comment on that. Okay. Um, and I'm just looking at my calendar. So November 5th is this Saturday, this Friday, which would give a week for the responses, but that's the end of the deadline. So if we got them by the 11th, which is on a Thursday. Well, then we get two and a half business hours to come up with amendments. Well, we have to request them on Wednesday and have them done by the 12th. Oh, yeah. So, Council Member Glover. I think the answer would be pretty simple, frankly, and that is, uh, they, and they've already said it, the, the money we've already allocated uh, in the original capital spending plan, uh, the 400 plus, Nothing's been touched on that yet. If we deferred this two weeks, it gives sufficient time to get all the answers in. Two if it comes in on the twelve or uh, two meetings, excuse me, it, it, it comes back in. We get all the answers that we're looking for, and then we can have a meaningful discussion. And if amendments need to be done, it would be done. So that would be my recommendation. And I move that we would defer, make the recommendation to defer two meetings, not one. Okay. That's been moved and seconded, um, just as we usually do, check with the administration. Is there anything timely in here that would be disrupted by a two-meeting deferral? That gives you, that gives you the full week to answer questions, which we appreciate, so. Okay, we're checking with juvenile court. But we, we can make our recommendation and then discuss it again. That's a, I appreciate that, that uh, creative solution. So it's been moved and seconded that we have a two-meeting deferral on the RS-2021, well, yeah, 1201. Uh, any more discussion on the two-meeting deferral? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? All right, we defer two meetings. We recommend. And we're down to 10, is that right? 10 in favor, zero against. Okay, uh, there are a lot coming up on consent, so we're, we're closer to being through them than it looks. Next is RS 2021-1202, sponsors Allen approves a grant from the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to the Metro Department of Finance to provide for the reimbursement of COVID-related eligible expenses. Do I have a motion? Yes. And a second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We recommend. Next is RS 2021-1203, sponsors Gamble, Johnston, Sepulveda, and Allen. Appropriates $150,000 from the American Recovery Plan Act for distribution to Fuse Corps and approves a grant contract to support fellowships as part of Fuse Corps Equitable Recovery Initiative. Then moved and seconded. Councilmember Hurt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have the same question um, that Councilmember Vercher uh, brought up uh, moments ago. How were these projects for uh, opera funding uh, prioritized? It's my understanding that um, these funds were expressly provided for communities that needed um, the most, and I just want to know how they prioritized the spending. Thank you. Can someone from the administration speak to that, Mr. Bunton? Mr. if we can continue to use your mic. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you, Council Lady Hurt. Um, Fuse Corps is a national advocacy org organization that provides executive fellows to cities across the country. Um, we have been uh, working on initiatives in several of these areas, after school programming, economic resilience, and also affordable housing. Um, Fuse Corps had an opportunity to, um, to uh, work with John Legend. He made, a he made a donation to Fuse Corps along with several other foundations, uh, which made it possible for us to secure fellows working in these three areas, affordable housing, 
after school activities and economic resilience. Specifically, the purpose of this grant was really specifically to work with um, areas that have suffered from systemic racism and a history of racism to make them more resilient. That's the point of the John Legend grant. So this is an opportunity for us at a steep discount from the normal price to advance important policy priorities in these three areas. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for that. And also, um, since Ms. Anna Harutyanan, did I say that right, has waited so long, I'm gonna just give you an opportunity to talk about the after school piece of the FUSE grant. Very Thank good. you, Thank Council you. Member Allen. Um, I lead NASA as part of a public library and NASA is the city's after school system that have been providing uh, free and high quality programs for after school. Uh, council members who have been supporting this work have been interested in expanding after school to the communities where we don't have the reach. And I think this partnership gives an opportunity to look into an overall demand and supply in the city, run a landscape analysis and understand like where the demand stands more and where the supply is because there is no one citywide uh, database where we can know what, there are many providers, but we don't know how scattered they are. And some parts have more programs than others. So just to create more uh, equal access to programming and also just have a better understanding what the program costs are. The funding levels that we provide right now, they don't seem to cover all the costs and our partners struggle to raise more funds to supplement. So this fellowship will also help us understand the true cost of the programming so that before we want to offer expansion of these programs, we also have a better understanding of the context, demand, and the cost and the capacity of the programs. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I know the other two were uh, providing experts on housing and other things. Yes, ma'am, Councilmember Gamble. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, we, with this setup, you can't see me over here waving my hand. Thank right. you for the opportunity to speak. I, I would like to speak to uh, Councilmember Hertz question about the process. The uh, COVID-19 Financial Oversight Committee uh, was addressed by the administration about this project and what struck us as why we felt it needed to be funded was that it provided three fellows for one year, uh, one for the planning department, one for the mayor's office and office of emergency management, and one for public libraries as uh, stated a moment ago. But the focus for these funds and for these fellows, fellows would be to support equity and how the COVID-19 pandemic relief is allocated as well as racial justice. And one of the things that we felt was beneficial in the first round of CARES money was that we had a study done by the Equity Alliance to help us with uh, making sure that funds and, and issues were discussed and, and funds were allocated equitably. And we wanted something like that uh, for this time as well. So when this came up, this provided an opportunity for us to have that uh, for, this, for, this, for this American Rescue Plan funding. So to your point, uh, th this was brought to us from the administration, some of the other um, resolutions that we'll be going through tonight were brought to us from the uh, administration or from the departments, metro departments. We have not begun to scratch the surface for the community need, and we we, we intend to do that out of this $259 million uh, for the second round of pandemic relief. Uh, but to your point, we, we, we look forward to getting to the community need. We have not yet we have just been um, presented with the uh, Metro departments and with this, but we do intend to get to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Sepulveda. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, and thank you to my colleague on the committee for, for speaking um, as to why we chose that this was an important thing to fund. I, I just wanna uh, make a note for, for everyone who is listening in that uh, we have so far um, begun with emergency needs um, and, and what needs to be expedient. Uh, we do have intentions to have community at, uh, input as to what is important for the community. And we're in the process, uh, and Mary Jo, if she needs to speak to, to this, can, 
uh, but we're in the process of setting something up potentially on Hub Nashville to receive community input. We have a draft guide uh, guide right now uh, that uh, has been put uh, out there and, and I, I sent out some information regarding the draft guide, but we wanna make sure that this is where the community sees, need, sees the most need. So there will be opportunity for community input. Thank you for explaining that, that's helpful. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? I think I heard some eyes, any opposed? You recommend, next. RS 2021-1204, sponsors Gamble, Johnston, Allen, Bradford, and Hauser appropriates $1,933,000 in American Rescue Plan Act funds to Metro Parks to be used for managing homeless encampments and renovation and repair of Brookmead Park. Oh, I have a motion. I have motions and lots of hands up. I'm just gonna work my way from left to right. Council Member Sora. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted some clarification. I know when we discussed a resolution a while back dealing with the homeless encampment in Brookmead, about 850,000, there was a lot of conversation about, was it just gonna be Brookmead Park? What are we doing with the other encampments around the city? Do we, and I remember that at that point, we named about two or three other locations. And so in reading this one, I know that this one mentioned Brookmead again. Uh, and we saw a picture today, it's much needed. But what about the other encampments? Does this 1.9 million, just like we tried to do with 850, does it address them as well? It's just not naming the resolution itself, but does it actually do it in, in, and in I'm spending? I'm gonna ask if, if committee members or Ms. Wiggins are the right ones to ask for that. Or Mr. Director Odom, thank you. With long hair, I did not recognize you. Yeah, if you'll come use Council Member Rutherford's mic, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the up. Hold it close. Ready? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. So about $850,000, as you mentioned, would be for the renovation um, of Brookmead Park and Greenway in this request. Um, the additional part of this um, request are um, include cameras and heavy equipment that would um, help our staff address other areas of uh, where there are um, individuals experiencing homelessness and there's a presence in the park system. As you all know, uh, our city has a, um, unfortunately, a homeless crisis. It is nowhere more evident than in the park system. Um, I've gotten calls and emails from probably each of you and um, this request goes toward, not only toward Brookmead um, Park and Greenway, but the entire park system. Thank you. Great, you might just wanna to hang till we finish. Uh, Council Member Hurt and then Council Member Mendez. Yes, my, my question was similar too because it was specific Brookmead Park and I agree that Brookmead Park does need this but I also think that Brookmead Park was neglected and it was not as much as COVID related using that considering that we're using ARPA funds. And I also look at six, eight and nine items, uh, 1204, 1206, 1207, and all of them speak to homelessness, you know? So, and, and I'm concerned about, I guess I can talk about 1207, why it's going to the impact division as opposed to Metro Social Services um, is, is the concern. But I'm just looking at three items here and, and they all have something to do with uh, the homeless community. And, and uh, not to say that we don't need to address it because I think we most certainly do, um, but I don't think it's all COVID related in why we need to. Thank you, Council Member Mendez. Thanks. Um, first, I appreciate the administration attaching an itemized list to the legislation. There's uh, some 30 line items, um, which is helpful. I do, um, see that about a quarter of the money is for about 125 quote eye in the sky cameras and the price tag is about um for most of them is thirty five hundred dollars each and the, the rest are five thousand dollars each so i assume this is different than the ring camera on my front door um and and especially in the context of the license plate reader legislation that we've got going 
I am curious to hear a little bit more about what these uh, 3,500 to 5,000 dollar, 125 of them eye in the sky cameras do and whether they're being monitored, whether they record, who monitors them, et cetera. Thank you, Council Member, I mean, uh, Director Odom. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so oh, Eye in the Sky is actually the name of the, the company with whom we've contracted. And we have a number of cameras across the park system already, probably about 300 um, in about 50 locations in the park system. Of course, it would be cost prohibitive to have um, cameras in every park. The, um, the footage is retained for 30 days at Metro ITS. They have possession of it. If for some reason there is an incident, um, there is a, the process works such as um, they'd have to go through park police um, to get to request the information. So if a private citizen has a public information request, they would go through parks police. If there is an incident um, involving law enforcement and they can um, think that they can find some footage that would uh, maybe assist them, that would also go through park police with a police report accompanying it. They request the information from ITS and use it for that park. So this, this uh, and are they monitored in real time by anybody? Some, some are monitored. So for instance, um, I'll say particularly in our community centers, I can think of maybe a few recent events uh, at McFerrin Community Center where there have been um, acts of violence. We can go back, the police can go back and review that footage right away to see if they can um, catch the perpetrator. But generally, no. Generally, it's, um, again, retained by ITS. So parks personnel has the ability to look back or you have to go through ITS to see that? Go through ITS or the police or parks police. And all of that footage is public record? It would be, but it would need to be requested through the public records request. Yes, so it's public record. Gotcha. Um, and... Well, I mean, just uh, Chair, I know this is crossing over a little bit into the LPR, but, but the concern that one of the concerns I've got about LPRs is that uh, sometimes they're used by some of the smaller communities. By, and we heard this last week at the demonstration. Um, some of the smaller communities that surround us literally say that the job is, uh, the, jo the reason they use license plate readers is to push crime back into Nashville. And so people from Nashville stop coming into their communities to prevent crime. And it feels like we're sort of essentially using the cameras in the parks to make sure that crime gets pushed out of parks. And so there's a, a little bit of a, a tension there that I'm, I guess, frankly, I'm struggling with. And so I just wanted to make sure that we all know this adds 125 cameras uh, at about a half a million. Um, to what we're doing, apparently public, subject to public records request. Thanks. Thank you for pointing that out. Council members, oh, Director Odom and then Council Member Sledge. I just wanted to add um, that I, I certainly understand your sentiment. Um, and one of the questions that I was asked after um, the COVID-19 Finance Committee meeting was, um, in the past two years, how many crimes have been solved using cameras? And while I, you know, I check with Park Police and MNPD, and while I don't have a record of those, what I can say is at a location where we at the time did not have a camera, I wish we had at the time in the past two years, was at Shelby Golf Course where one of our Park's teammates was murdered. Um, we have since added cameras there and are adding them at other um, golf courses and other locations where Either there has there is high foot or vehicle traffic. There are large or special events. There, um, quite frankly, may have been uh, reports of um, criminal activity. But I just wanted to add that cameras are can be helpful. Um, thank you. Appreciate that, Councilmember Sledge. Thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, Director Odom. And I apologize to put you on the spot on something that we worked on together. But we we did have a. Um, pretty significant um, issue at Asafran Park, in District 17, um, that put a lot of people at risk. There were crimes against other people occurring. Um, there, were, there was a variety of things happening. And that is a park where we do have a camera. And, and quite frankly, it was unbeknownst to me that we had a camera there. 
until we started going through this issue. And so, director, in that instance, the camera, Osfron Park, for those who don't know, is, is, a, is a, think of a single residential lot, and it just goes all the way back. Um, and so there's a little bit of street frontage, but it's pretty deep after that. And the camera is located on Nolensville Pike, at least on that end. The vast majority of the incidents we were seeing were on the back of the property. In that instance, do you feel like the camera helped in, in the efforts that we were doing? I, I really don't know, to be honest. I, I believe so, that mm -hmm. they did. And then plus we were getting reports from, um, you know, the, the people in the in the uh, community center there at, at Azafran, mm -hmm. um, public citizens, um, our maintenance staff. So, yeah, I think they were they were probably. So it was a combined. It was a combined. Report plus yes. camera. So, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director. Thank you. A short divergence there. I appreciate that. Council Member Gamble, are you? Are you back on the, this bill about? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for recognizing later. me as I'm not on the committee. Just wanted to add, and, and thank you, Director Odom, for your explanation. The, the concerns were addressed and brought up during our COVID-19 Financial Oversight Committee, uh, and when it was explained that there are already 300 cameras in our parks now, and that these cameras uh, were needed because they uh, the list of, of where the placements are is where we have uh, our urban camps, and these parks do not have cameras. And so this would just help keep parks safe uh, for everyone that are using the parks, and that's why uh, I signed on a, as a sponsor to the bill and, and why I support it and ask for you all support as well. Thank you. Good, good questions. Uh, Council Member Sepulveda. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Dr. Odom, for being here. Um, I I didn't sign on and I didn't vote for this legislation. Um, I was the only one in the committee. I, like Council Member Mendez, had some concerns about um, having more surveillance in our public areas. And that's, that's one of my main concerns. Um, I, I want... I guess I, I, I'm the youngest one here, and we, people in my generation, have been online for so long, and uh, cameras are everywhere, and cameras are it, it, everywhere in different parts of, of this country. And so we, I don't want to speak to everyone, but uh, I have some concerns about where it is that that we're surveilling people. Um, I understand wanting to make sure that we keep our parks clean and that uh, we are protecting people. I just, this wouldn't be the way I would choose uh, to spend money. I'd rather give more money to parks for land and to update some of the other parks. Uh, and and because I, I do feel like they don't receive enough money as is. If this had just the bottom part where we updated uh, Brookmead, I would gladly vote for it. Um, but I, as it stands, I, I just, I'm not comfortable putting cameras where people take their children and uh, some people just want privacy and, and I respect that. And, and I, I'm not gonna be able to vote for this tomorrow, um, but I, I do encourage, um, the Parks Department to come back to us uh, if there are other requests uh, where we can use more ARP money uh, to potentially solve some other issues. Thank you. Anyone else? Good discussion. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Sledge. I think we might be moving to this tomorrow, so I'm just going to try it here. I'm going to move for one meeting deferral. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on a one meeting deferral? The usual question, uh, does that cause any disruption to funding or anything? There's, are there any timing issues? Okay, that's that's good to clarify. Council Member Pulley. Uh, that's all I want to do is uh, get the administration's perspective on the deferral and see if there were any issues with uh, timeliness here. I, I see head shaking no, so that's any other any other discussion on one meeting deferral? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? We defer one meeting. Ms. Odom, thank you so much for providing good information on this. Nine. Okay, now we're on RS 2021-1205, Johnson Gamble, Sepulveda, Allen, and Evans. 
This appropriates $996,500 in American Recovery Plan Act funds to the Office of Emergency Management to be used for COVID-19 related response vehicles and technology. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councilmember Ms. Discussion? Again, I want to thank the administration for having the itemized list uh, attached to it. It's very, very helpful to have the itemized list. Thank you. Thank you for that positive reinforcement. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? We approve. Next is RS 2021-1206, Johnson Gamble, Sepulveda, Allen & Welsh, revert, appropriates a million dollars in American Rescue Plan Act funds to various metro departments to be used for vaccination and assessment centers, homeless emergency shelters, personal protective equipment, sanitization, and signage. Do you have a motion? It's been moved and seconded. We're getting close to water, don't leave us. Um, all right, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Yes, Councilmember Mendez. You shouldn't have thanked me for the positive reinforcement because <laughs> um, it was laying the groundwork for there being no itemization on this one. Um, and yeah. and I, I just wonder, I mean, this is basically appropriating to petty cash um, without an itemization to go along with it. And so my request would be, can we get an itemization by the time we are voting tomorrow? Ms. Wiggins. Thank you. Um, essentially, the itemization was intended to be um, not to split out specific amounts for vaccination, homeless shelters, uh, PPE, sanitiz sanitization, and signage. Um, we had various departments request varying amounts under each of those categories. And rather than trying to um, have very specific amounts for every single department, what we really wanted to do is create um, the opportunity for those as needed that when they have those needs, they can order PPE. They don't have to um, stock up for an entire year. They can spend as it's needed and that all the departments that need those specific items can charge those expenses to this fund. So the idea was not to have by department, by P PPE, by signage, by sanitization, but rather create a fund. Thank you. Councilmember Mendez. So I hear that, um, and but we, we should, we, I mean, so it's right. It is a essentially a COVID supply, petty cash supply at finance where they'll decide when various departments express a need. And I, I guess the fact that it's a um, million dollars on the grand scale, I mean, so that's. Can we ask about documentation at the end of that? Will we be able to see where it went? Does that. Yes, absolutely. The committee has already requested that in advance that um, every time anything is spent out of that fund, we will have by nature of what it was spent on, which one of those categories, which department and amount. And so every time that fund is charged, we'll report that in our monthly oversight committee reports. And is um, what Ms. Wiggins just said reflected in legislation anywhere, Mr. Jamison? I don't, I don't think it is. Well, I guess what I'd ask is if um, Ms. Eitlin or Mr. Jamison could come up with a late filed amendment to this one that says that, um, then I'm guessing we can probably slide that by without objection tomorrow. Thank you. So request to amend to, to document. Okay, since we don't have that yet, we can't vote on it here, but, um, and okay, can you go to rules? tomorrow to make sure that, <laughs> thank you. All right, uh, so we uh, we expect an amendment on this that we don't have in hand yet, uh, but given that we uh, expect to have, we know there will be documentation and that will be added as part of legislation. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Or anybody? Ah, thank you, any opposed? All right, wake up everybody, we're getting close. Next is RS 2021-1207, sponsor Sepulveda, Gamble, Allen, Welsh, and Hauser. This appropriates $1,541,400 in ARPA funds to the Homeless Impact Division of Metro Social Services to be used for shelter, outreach, sanitation, housing, and food. Was there an itemization? Yes, thank you, thank you for the itemization. Is there any discussion on this one? Uh, Councilmember Suara. 
Thank you. And I have not seen the itemization, so it could be on me. Uh, but one of the conversation, and I don't know if this is, uh, anyone can answer this. One of the conversations that came up in some of the homeless conversation that we had was a suggestion to have a storage space uh, uh, for folks to be able to put their, their, their items. And it was strongly suggested that, you know, if people have a place to put their things, they can go for the vaccination, they can go to the shelter at night because they want, they're really worried about their, their belongings. And so I discussed with the, um, uh, Ms. Renee Pratt with social services, if this is something that we're going to try and do. So I guess my question is, since this money is going to social services, do we know if that's something that we decide to do or not to do? Because it seems like a, a small solution suggested by somebody who used to be homeless that wouldn't take a lot of fun, but can help with us trying to tackle this, this issue. Is that something that either the committee or Ms. Pratt, I see Ms. Pratt is here, and answer, if you'll come up and use Mr. Rutherford's Ms. microphone. Ms. Eitlin will turn it on. Thank you so much for that question. We are providing um, locker space through the shelter, the COVID shelter. We also provide locker space at the mission as well. So after I spoke to you, I talked to them and asked, is there any additional locker space that is needed? And at the time they indicated no. But we can do that if they make that request again. It was more around when we were doing the fairgrounds, COVID sheltering, and then also the mission and them not being able to accept people as well. So now that's kind of leveled out and we're able to provide the necessary lockers for them. But if we find in the future that it's needed, we don't have a problem in doing it. Because it came from someone who was on the street. Right. And he actually argued that that is a, a something that matters, that you may look at the, the position and think it's nothing, but to them it's all that they had. Oh, they and so, so I think creating local spaces or having additional spaces shouldn't cost a whole lot of money. Uh, and if it would be very helpful, I think we should look into that more than what we already have. So that's, that's my suggestion. Thank you. That is important. Uh, Council Member Sledge? No questions. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Pratt? Uh, Council Member Hurt. Um, thank you. I, I agree with uh, Council Member uh, Suara because I also attended that meeting and he, he, uh, she's absolutely correct that he said if he had a storage space, so without even having space for them to, uh, for shelter, it was very important for them to be able to have their uh, belongings cared for. But I'd like to ask for a deferral because I'd like to see this money go into Metro Social Services as opposed to the Homeless Impact Division, especially considering the fact that um, we just have a new, uh, had someone to re resign from that position. We've got a new director and it falls under Metro Social Services anyway, and they're providing those um, uh, services. So I'd ask for uh, one meeting deferral so we can discuss uh, that possibility. There's a second. Any discussion on a one meeting deferral? Can can someone explain the the, the difference between going to the a division of the homeless homeless impact division of Metro Social Services? Ms. Wiggins. Thank you, Chair. Um, Council Lady Hurt, could we do an amendment to just change it to social services? Is that what you're asking? Would that that would be another late filed. Can you show up at rules to shepherd that late filed amendment? Okay. All right. So we've had a suggestion to change the language so that it goes to the, directly to Metro Social Services. Does that work for you, Ms. Pratt? Okay. I think, sounds like we're, we're happy with that. So given that amend. So is there a motion for that amendment? We didn't vote on your other amendment. Um, well, we know what it will be. We just don't have it written yet. So, okay. Change your motion. I'm sorry. I move that we approve it, and we will add an amendment. Add an amendment. Okay. Thanks. So the motion has been changed to approval, uh, pending an, an um, amendment to be filed late tomorrow. Councilmember Sledge. This is process, both on this one and the previous one. Since we know we're going to have to knock these off consent. Tomorrow, can we make a note and have them already off consent so we can save some time? Thank you, Ms. Silence. So thank you. Okay, you're you're keeping track of that. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, any other any other questions? So all those in favor um, 
of approval with an amendment to be added tomorrow. Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That was enthusiastic. Um, on this one, I think there was. All right, we finally get to a bunch of them that are on consent. Uh, 1208 is 1209 was removed from consent. RS 2021-1209 sponsors to Allen and Withers. This authorizes Director of Public Property Administration to exercise an option to purchase property at 1354 Brick Church Pike and Zero Brick Church Pike. I have a letter from the sponsor to defer. Uh, and she is gone, so we will uh, we will defer. All those in favor of one meeting deferral? Aye. Any opposed? We defer. Okay, next, uh, let me skip a bunch on consent. Next is BL, um, RS 2021-1214, sponsors Allen and Evans, approves a Homeland Security grant from the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to the Metro Office of Emergency Management. Do I have a motion? Moved and second. Any discussion? Anybody want to talk about it? It's getting late. Seeing no request, unless unless the emergency folks, since they've waited so long, want to come talk. But if you don't, we'll we'll move on. All those in favor? Any opposed? All right, we approve. Next is RS twenty twenty one. Whoops, we are more on consent. RS twenty twenty one twelve twenty three. Is that the next one, Ms. Zeitlin? Yes, okay, next is RS 2021-1223. Sponsor is Allen, authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Shelley and James Rayleigh against Metro government in the amount of $140,000. Been moved, second, and seconded. Any discussion? Mr. Mendez. I feel like Councilman Pulley did such a great job of asking about every single one of these last term that he's sort of obligated to start doing that again. I'm only kidding. Oh, all right. Any other useful discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? You recommend. Next is RS 2021 1225 sponsors Allen and Young, appropriates $8.6 million for the benefit of water and sewerage services. Do you have a motion? Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I know there's no discussion on this bill, but I did ask the water department to come and we are almost through with everything else. I, I would like to give you all the opportunity to, to just give us a little bit of information about other things. Are y'all willing to wait through three more bills and then, and then I will ask y'all to just come answer a couple of questions. Thank you so much for sticking around. Okay, so we are just uh, voting on the 8.6 million um, for the benefit of water and sewage services. Any question on that piece of it? Mr. All right, this is moving money into the flood buyout, um, which we match with federal dollars, and it has helped us get a lot of things out of the floodplain. Any other questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? We recommend. 1226 is on consents. Next is a late filed resolution. Sponsors Allen and Bradford approves amended shuttered venue operators grant from the U.S. Small Business Administration. The municipal auditorium for emergency assistance for venues affected by COVID-19. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? You recommend. Next, our bills on second reading. There's just a small number. BL 2021-912 sponsors Allen O'Connell, Suara, Porterfield, and Welsh. This amends the Metro Code to create a mechanism for the implementation of the Inclusionary Housing Incentive Program. And that is a motion to defer with the brief explanation. This tracks with Bill 832, and both of those do have a little bit of um, work to be done. I'm working with uh, the administration and several departments to work out those details, and we'll bring it back in, uh, in two meetings. So motion to defer. That needs to be deferred to, right, to December, defer two meetings. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of two meeting deferral? Any opposed? Next is BL 2021-962, sponsors Parker, Allen, and Withers, authorizes the Director of Public Property Administration to accept a donation of 14 square feet of property located between 914 East Trinity Lane and 938 East Trinity Lane. Been moved. Did. Duly moved and seconded. All the, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? 
Any opposed? None, zero. Thank you. Uh, and last is BL 2021-963, sponsor O'Connell, Allen Withers, Bradford Young, Welsh, and Hancock. Approves a Greenway Conservation Easement and Greenway Participation Agreement and Declaration in connection, connection with improvements to the Bicentennial Greenway Connector. I understand there's an amendment. Councilmember Mendez. I move move the amendment, and I I can uh, I, I mentally zoned out. Sorry. Um, I'll move the amendment, and then once it's second, I can offer an explanation. Okay, it's been seconded. Oh, brief explanation. All right. So um, the amendment is. Uh, simply adding a whereas to clarify what everybody's understanding is. Um, and um, it's born out of the e-bike debate. And, and the idea is to try to um, have this be relatively uh, benign and, and not subject to a lot of debate. What I've heard in the e-bike debate is that there's some easements that the city, that Parks has that say, I've been told e-bikes aren't allowed. Um, and this easement um, says motorized vehicles are not allowed. Under state law, e-bikes are not motorized vehicles. And so the whereas just clarifies that there's no intention in the easement agreement to prohibit e-bikes. Now, if the city and parks wants, if the council and parks want to have a rule that say you can't have e-bikes, you know, that's a debate that we're going to have in the future, I think. Um, but it shouldn't be, uh, everybody should be clear the easement itself does not prohibit e-bikes. And so this just adds a whereas to, to make that clear. Great. Thank you. Any other questions on the amendment? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Amendment passes. Uh, it's been moved as amended. Any discussion on the bill as amended? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right. If y'all will stick around for just another second. Um, I offered... Uh, to give Mr. Potter or, um, or Mr. Honeysucker, whoever, just the opportunity to just give us a quick um, update on possible financial implications that might come from the announcement about Red River. We got the whole team coming up. Um, you can come up, except the mics are acting goofy. If you want to come up front and hold one of these mics, that'll be fine. Yeah, if you'll just come on up here and... Okay. We got two mics up here for you. Thank you so much. And I didn't mean to make you wait the whole time. I just kept, I kept thinking water would come up. None of those work, so. So good evening, members of council. Um, what I'd like to do first is just kind of give you a, um, an update of where we stand operationally. Um, and Mr. Honeysucker will do that first, and we'll kind of talk about what the uh, implications of the Red River bankruptcy are. So, John. Good evening. I want to talk a little bit about the status of Of where we are with our waste services uh, division. Uh, a lot of you I've been in constant communication with to share with you what we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. I do want to just give you a brief overview of our status uh, with the, within the division. Um, waste services is experiencing a lot of fleet issues right now. We are currently working with our uh, with fleet uh, to try to resolve these matters and this is and they are doing a good job of working with us these issues that we're having uh, within fleet uh, is partly universal with parts and, and, and labor and staff and things like that. But I do want to emphasize that uh, our personnel in charge of fleet, uh, Jesse Fisher is doing a great job working with them and they are trying diligently to help us overcome these challenges. But right now with, within waste services, I want to talk a little bit about the operational impact that we are, we're facing right now. Our currently uh, with the staff, uh, we have front loaders. Uh, we have 10 uh, front loaders that are assigned to our division right now. Currently, as of this moment, we have one that was just brought back in service today out of 10. That is greatly impacting our ability to do our job. Rear loaders, we have 33 assigned right now that are 18 yard rear loaders. 14 of those are in operation. We have uh, five assigned eight 
uh, rear loaders, two of those are in service. Our side loaders, we have 20, uh, 25, 28 yard assigned in, in our division, and 15 of those are in service. We have six yard, uh, I'm sorry, we have eight six yard side loaders, six of those are in operation. As for our roll offs, we have 11 that are assigned. The roll offs cover our convenience centers uh, and recycle centers throughout the city. We have 11 of those assigned. Currently, we have zero of those that are in operation. Actually, we may have one that was assigned that just came out, one that was just actually released this afternoon. But that's one out of so many days that we've been out of service with that. Now, how does that impact us as a municipality? Uh, with the great support of the administration uh, being very reactive to helping us try to overcome these adversities, uh, we, were we were able to secure a subcontractor to come in and they'll be doing the work of going around, picking up at the convenience centers and at the recycle centers in order for us to stay afloat. If we did not, with the support of the administration uh, and general services of fleet, to get these uh, subcontractors in, basically that would have crippled us. We were looking, we were already minimizing what was being taken in at some, at two of the centers, but by us minimizing that, it was transferring the additional burden to the other locations. So also, if you have to look at it from this perspective, if we were to continue down the path we were going, by uh, basically it would have required us to close the centers. Now, I appreciate the leadership that Director Potter is, is, is putting in intact with our team. His first rule is safety. That is safety for the employees and the staff. These trucks were in bad condition prior to even coming underwater. They were in bad condition. We can't talk about historically what has happened because I don't know. But what I can say is what we have seen and the position that we have, st our stance is within water. We have a team in place, as you can see, a very positive support team that we will not allow safe, unsafe vehicles to be on the road. And I'm very transparent and passionate about that. This man right here is committed to making sure that people are able to return home as they came to work. Father. So we're, um, we're renting a lot of trucks and um, it's getting us through this. I wanna stress that General Services is working really hard to help. Okay? We're not throwing rocks at anybody. Um, it's just gonna to continue to be difficult. What, um, I wanna to transition to the, to the Red River bankruptcy and how it is affecting us and presently, it hasn't, it hasn't impacted us. Um, we're, we're gonna have an update on Thursday with uh, the Red River leadership and their, um, their specialist who is um, leading them through their restructuring. I, I think that this is uh, a process where they're infusing capital into the organization to make it more stable, which I think is the only good thing out of this because if, um, if we don't have a, a stable provider, we have to go into an emergency situation and I think that would be really, really expensive. On Thursday afternoon, after we have that meeting with Red River, I'll send an email update to um, the council to let y'all know where that's going. And then um, I wanna talk about how we're gonna go into the future and pose a, a, I guess, a suggestion to the council. The Red River contract expires November, 2024. Is that correct, Shannon, Sharon? Okay, I wanna make sure I get my numbers right. So we've got between now and probably January 2023 to get a plan in place. So what I wanna do is, um, is go through a process of, of retaining a firm with expertise in execution of municipal waste pickup. So what I'm not advocating is a, is a waste study. Um, I'm advocating a study about how we actually pick up the trash in, the, uh, in all areas of the USD, to include downtown, all the neighborhoods, that way we have um, an assessment of the as is, and then we can propose a series of options that we can present to council um, to identify how we're gonna solve this problem in the long term. During that process, I, I also propose that, that I come um, with, with staff every quarter to update y'all about where we are in that. That way we can uh, keep the council informed on progress. And what I expect at the conclusion of that study is a series of, of options 
that we can, we can draw from. Minimally, we'll need to have an RFP prepared that will solicit a variety of services that we won't have all our horses in one barn, so to speak. We'll have options that we can, that we can draw from so we're not beholden to one contractor. We'll also take a look at what level of, um, of, of demand we'll place on city services, um, because right now it's about a 65-35 split. Is that right, Sharon? So we, want, we may want to expand that 35%. We may not, but we need to have um, a discussion about it to make sure we proceed with what makes most sense. So that's kind of our summary. Um, I think the best thing for us to do is to get an expert in here, identify how best to get the trash picked up. And we continue with all of our waste, um, our waste stream studies separate from that process. And we quarterly update y'all about where we are, and hopefully we can come up with a solution that makes sense for the city for the next uh, you know, 15 to 20 years. I do want to point out that the Red River contract was put into place in 2003. Sharon, is that correct? The Red River contract was in 2003? 2004. Um, so it does expire in, in three years, so I think we have time to uh, get a plan together that makes sense, keeping the council fully informed the whole time. So, I'm Withers. Oh, thanks, Councilmember Mendez. Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, just on that Red River bankruptcy, um, I've spent uh, way, way too much of my professional life working on large Chapter Eleven cases, and um, and I, so I would urge. That the, the the job of the restructuring professional, the guys you guys are talking to, is to um, sell, sell, sell in the context of the truth. Because usually in most restructurings, if they lose the confidence of the customer base, then it does a big swirl down the toilet. And so there's there is a a balance of getting the truth versus it is a sell job, and. Um, uh, it sounds like from everything I've heard, you guys are approaching it with an appropriate amount of skepticism. Um, but I would definitely um, like like know they're selling um, because if they lose confidence from not us, but if they lose confidence from other customers, restructuring professionals can go from we're going to definitely you know recapitalize and be better than ever, and on top of it all, they can go from that to oh you know crap, we're going to leave ten other cities you know, overnight, and sure. as long as you guys are ready for that. I'd, uh, I'd like to bring your experience to bear, if I could. So um, I'm not sure if you would participate in listening to those calls. It may help us out a lot, a great deal. I, um, for six years, have made a hard break between legal services and being a politician, but I would, um, I would come and sit in on those calls and, and offer my that, my context if you guys feel like it's okay it's totally up to you guys i'd welcome it all right just let me know sir councilman mendez I, I would like to add uh while we are going through this process uh with our team we are looking at uh having some contingency plans uh, in place we are meeting with other vendors just as a to have a backup plan in case of uh, any other thing thank you for that anybody anybody else uh council member suara Thank you. I'm going to leave the conversation on the bankruptcy to the experts. Uh, but it's on um, Mr. Onisaka's presentation about what you're assigned and what you can use and all of that. And from what I'm hearing, it appears as if you're not able to, you don't have trucks that are functioning or that you're having problem with them and you're having to rent. So this is where I'm a little bit confused. One of the things that I've noticed in the last year or so is that the water department has a lot of money. And I've been trying to figure a way out a way to get that money to be used in operation, which we can't because you're separate. But, but from the last audit that we look at and the conversations that I've had with your finance lady, you have money in there that you could use. So what I'm baffled at is if that money is there and you continue to put the reserve aside and you continue to build that money and it's already higher than what the state recommended, what is stopping us from using it for the fleet that you needed for the water department? Council A, we can't use water and sewer funds to buy fleet for waste services. You cannot, yes, even if it's for water department. We cannot. Ah, that, 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 that's not good. Is there any way around it? Because the money, the money is... Mm. 
<laughs> we promised the rate payers. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it goes to the bond covenants, Council Lady, and if we, every, when we issue a bond mm. for um, water and sewer, we, I guess we state under oath, for want of a better phrase, that we will use that money to improve the system. So I, I understand that. I understand with regards to the, to the bond part of it. But what I'm talking about is that if, I, if I'm not mistaken within the rates that you're collecting from the people, and there's a, there's a set aside, and I don't have access to that audit information that we talk about, right? That money is what I'm talking about. So, so is that not available? And when we spoke, we talk about actually being able to use some of that reserve sort of, or set aside money to do some of your capital purchases so you don't have to use your bond, so you don't have to get another loan, right? So why can't this, that part is what I'm asking about. Yes, ma'am. The um, water and sewer rates have to specifically be used for water and sewer benefit of the system. And it's, we pledge our revenues and they actually go in a very specific flow of funds that do not include waste services. Waste services is funded through property tax mm -hmm. as well as some other fees. Um, and they specifically go to the benefit of the USD and GSD taxpayers. So the fleet that we're talking about is the waste and not nothing to do on the water side. Yes, each one of okay. the categories okay. that John okay. detailed was is, um, is was on the a, waste it's, side. It's okay. picking up waste. Yes. Okay, okay. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the confusion because I know that the money is on the water side. And I thought we we're talking about the water department. Okay. So this is waste and that's why... It's not a lot, okay. We are Got carrying it. several several different funds at this point, including the special revenue fund that is waste services. Okay, no, we we did have a conversation about yes, I do know the difference between the waste and the and the water. But when you came up to speak, I was I, I thought it was okay. Arby. All right, so we've got to find a way to use that money. So we'll keep looking at it. <laughs> Thanks. Any other any other questions, mm. Councilmember Vercher? Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, can we be provided how much it's costing us to subcontract running uh, these trucks? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. If you'll just provide that to Ms. Ms. Island and copy me, we'll do that. Any other, Ms. Hurt? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to know the demographics of your waste services staff and workers. <laughs> Well, with, are you excuse me, specifically looking at waste services? Yes. Okay. I think right now, roughly, if you're looking at uh, about 85% African American and about 15% Caucasian, uh, male versus female, you're probably looking at about 98% uh, male and about 2% female. Okay. So now, what's the demographics for Metro Water Services? I'll get that to you. I have that in my computer. I can send it to you in the morning. Okay. Is it possible for you to give it to me in comparison? You're showing me what Department of Water Services demographics are in comparison to what Waste Services demographics are. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? All right. Oh, I just want to make a comment because I, I'm, I'm like... Uh, Councilmember Mendez, I don't have much faith in, in this bankrupt uh, organization, considering that we, for September 2021, there were 2,100 trash complaints, 1,600 mistrashed, and 773 mis recycling. And, you know, I'm just wondering how did we get to this point, because if this is September 2021, if we go back month back months uh, at a time, I'm sure this data will still be consistent. So how did we get here and we didn't see this bleed and stop it? I think with, uh, with the material that you're referencing, uh, this is a combination uh, of historical events that have been taking place. And I, what I don't, what I want to remind the council is this has been, this is a recent transition under the water uh, tutelage. What we have done is started making changes to better the process. Um, because, and I do want to share something with you that, that I'm constantly reminded of that Director Potter shared with me 
and to put emphasis on to change culture. He says, asking me to overlook a simple safety violation would be asking me to compromise my entire attitude towards the value of your life. That right there is something that I live by. That's making sure that these, these, this staff and the team that I have is safe and they have a quality product to do the service that's needed within this city. We don't have that. They don't have that. And that's why it has caused us to have to revert to the fact of if we have to pull fleet off the road to make sure that our staff is safe, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that we provide the best and quality that we can for them to do the job. Now, misses and things like that, I can't explain that, Council Lady Hurt. What I can say is that we're working to change that culture right now, and it will make a difference. One of the things that we're doing is holding people accountable. There are other things that take place. Sometimes it's morale. I, again, I can't go back and tell you exactly why those things happen, but I can tell you, and I can assure you, me being a person that is very transparent with the council, and I trust that, that you all receive that, I'm going to make sure you know what's going on. And I, I'm, I'm asking for your support tonight to support me to make sure that we change that, not just today, every day. And I'm asking for your support to make that happen. And that's what it'll take. But I will actually look back at the historical numbers, and I want to see, I think, Sharon, we can actually pull those type of things to see where there's been a somewhat of an up and down roller coaster ride. And I'm not going to stand up here and blame it on COVID. I'm not going to do that. People have used that too much. I'm just going to say that we have to change the work ethics within the division, and we're working on that. If I can ask one final question. Thank you all so much for being there. Do you see any of this affecting the operating budget for the year or right now? Does the measures y'all are taking fit within the No, we're going to have to come budget? for a, a supplemental. Okay. Because the, the rental for the trucks is going to be significant. If you can help prepare us for that as you as you learn stuff, if you can let us know, that, that'd be helpful. The estimation, we'll get you the actual, hopefully to the decimal point, but we're estimating two and a half million for okay. six months. For six months. Okay. That's just good to be prepared for that. It's a $2 billion That's budget. That's just for so. the trucks. That's just for the rentals. That's the rentals. So additional expenses may come forth. That's just for the trucks. Great. Okay. If you can just keep us keep us informed as you learn stuff, that, that would be helpful. We, we understand the difficulty. Thank you all for being here and thank the staff for coming as well. And appreciate you all sticking around till the end. It's good information. We are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.